All right, so this last section of meiosis, we're going to talk about how genetic variation is created, um, specifically through what is known as a crossing over event. A crossing over event occurs during that synapsis of prophase one of meiosis one. So this occurs when the corresponding pieces of chromatids of maternal and paternal homologs are exchanged during synapse at prophase one. In other words, and I'll show you a video of this, but please ask in our discussion groups. I would love to explain this in greater detail with lots of my handmade drawings, which are lovely. There's a reason I went into science and not into artistry. But anyway, so our crossing over events. So we're going to see homologous pairs line up, form a synapse. They're actually going to like lie on top of each other, and they're going to start swapping DNA real gross, but they're going to start swapping corresponding pieces of chromatids. So where one maternal um, bit of DNA said, hey, blue eyes, the paternal DNA said, hey, brown eyes, they might actually swap. So now the maternal chromosome says brown eyes and the paternal chromosome says um, says blue eyes. And so um, those chromosomes can actually swap. So in this case, and I'm going to just explain it using my family so we can kind of see how this would work. Not to be too crude, but when we were in the process of making me, my mother's egg would have undergone a process called crossing over. So before it was an egg, it would have undergone a process known as crossing over. And her maternal and paternal chromosomes would have started swapping. I am not a 50-50 copy of um, my mom and dad. I am actually some random assortment of my four grandparents. So I got, you know, um, I may have ended up with grandma, my grandma's, um, I may have ended up with her chromosome for, um, for chin uh, shape and nose shape, but I got my, but I also got on her chromosome, I got grandpa's eye color and I got grandpa's ears. And so it's because those chromosomes can actually swap information. So what started out as grandma's chromosome and grandpa's chromosome in the contribution to making me, it actually turned into some sort of random blended assortment of chromosome that then got passed down to me. And when I passed down to, um, my offspring, they are going to get some random blended chromosome um, from my mom and a random blended chromosome from my dad that are going to come together, blend, stir up, and form their own new blended chromosome to be passed down. So that's the crossing over event. Independent assortment is going to be a little bit different. So the independent assortment is the relative positioning of homologs um, of maternal and paternal chromosomes with respect to the poles of the cell is random. So the members of each homologous pair are going to orient independently from others during metaphase one. And don't worry, I'm going to kind of show you how this works. But that's just to say, just because I got grandma's, you know, I got grandma's chromosome one, it doesn't mean I get grandma's chromosome two and chromosome three and chromosome four. I might have grandma's chromosome one, grandpa's chromosome two, grandma's chromosome three, grandma's chromosome four, grandma's chromosome five, grandpa's chromosome six, seven, and eight. Uh, there's just no knowing. Each egg, each division could be a completely random assortment of those. So here is an example of what that um, crossing over event looks like. We're going to start with our pair of a pair of duplicated homologous chromosomes. We're going to synapse at prophase one, and we're going to just start swapping DNA. Just start swapping DNA. This also means that sister chromatids are no longer identical. When we enter meiosis two, we do not have identical sister chromatids. We started off with identical sister chromatids, but once we start undergoing this DNA exchange, these are no longer chromosomes or no longer identical. This is why every single haploid cell that comes out of uh, meiosis is going to be completely genetically unique. We don't have any copies. Um, so we have one offspring that's going to have a completely maternal chromosome, one that's going to be a combination, uh, mostly maternal with a little bit of paternal DNA, one that's going to be mostly paternal with a little bit of maternal DNA, and then one completely um, paternal chromosome. So there's a completely different assortment. This is also why you can look significantly more like one of your cousins than maybe even your own sibling or maybe even one of your um, 
you know, even your parents. I don't look anything like either of my parents. I look almost exactly like my cousin, which must mean that I have a crap ton of um, Grandma Finney's chromosomes. So I have a, not only a lot of her chromosomes, but a lot of her chromosomes are probably pretty pure in the sense that they don't have a whole lot of mixing going on there. Um, so that is how, <clears throat> excuse me, that is how the, um, uh, crossing over events work, but we can also get in from, or we can also get variety, um, from independent assortment in the event that we are looking at only two, um, that we are looking at only two chromosomes. Those two chromosomes could line up in one of two ways. We could either line up maternal, paternal, paternal, maternal, or we could line up maternal, paternal, maternal, paternal. So just if we only had two chromosomes, we could line up two different ways and they're going to produce very different results. When they separate, this um, daughter cell is going to have one maternal and one paternal. This one's going to have um, paternal and one maternal. This one is going to have uh, two maternal. This one will have two paternal. So we already have, just with only two different types of lining up, we already have four distinct possibilities for metaphase one. Or coming out of, I'm sorry, for coming out of meiosis one. Then, if we've done any crossing over events, each one of these is going to be completely unique, completely separate and individual. So this is how we get insane amounts of genetic variation within our population. So here's table 19.1. It's going to help sort of break down the main differences and similarities between mitosis and meiosis. I would like you to spend a little bit of time with that. Um, I would like you to spend just a little bit of time um, with this table for mitosis and meiosis. Um, know the similarities, know the differences, um, so on and so forth. All right, the last thing that we're going to talk about is when things go wrong. Um, so this process is, these are, we're going to be talking about homeostatic imbalances of meiosis. Um, one of those could be non-disjunction. Non-disjunction occurs when there's a failure of the homologous chromosomes to separate during meiosis one or of sister chromosomes to separate during meiosis two. In other words, what has happened is that we did not lock down and check our mitotic spindles when we were about to go separate. So during the process of metaphase, we have to make sure that our mitotic spindle fibers are locked into place before we begin the separation process. If we don't have our seat belts on, we're going to see that um, this, the homologous chromosomes are not going to separate properly or the sister chromosomes are not going to result properly. Non-disjunction is going to result in either too many, too few, or too few chromosomes in a cell. And the imbalance of chromosomes usually causes abnormalities in development um, and most frequently results in miscarriage. So here we're going to look at what that non-disjunction looks like. If non-disjunction were to occur in um, the first meiotic division, so in this case we have two homologous pairs on one side and nothing on the other side, we're going to end up with um, chromosomes that are missing. We're going to end up with cells that are missing a chromosome. In this case, we have cells that have one additional chromosome. If that um, we have a normal first meiotic division, but we have a uh, abnormal second meiotic division, we're going to end up with um, we're going to end up with um, well, these are misplaced. Disregard these labels down here. We're going to end up with these two cells have the normal number of chromosomes, but these chromosomes over here, um, we have one additional chromosome here and one missing chromosome here. So please take a moment um, and just swap these labels in your mind. Normal number over here, one additional here, one missing here. When we have one additional chromosome, it's called a trisomy. Um, this is when we have three representatives of a chromosome in a cell. There are um, three there are three trisomies that um, do not result in a auto um, abortion most trisomies are not viable most trisomies will not make it even as far as the, the zygote stage um, but there are three trisomies that can make it as far as the zygote stage but only one of them will actually um, survive early childhood and that it would be trisomy 21 also known as down syndrome 
An infant born with three copies of uh, Down syndrome is an infant born with three copies of chromosome 21. The risks of having a, uh, in a baby with Down syndrome um, tends to increase with maternal age because uh, that's when we're going to see sort of a breakdown of that meiotic um, process. Um, there are multiple physical and mental abnormalities that are associated with Down syndrome, but we're not going to go into each one of those. This chapter is one where I really want you to take some time to look at the different homeostatic imbalances associated with either additional or missing or, you know, monosomies or trisomies of um, various genetic disorders. So I would like you to adopt your own, look into it, um, and give me an example of a homeostatic imbalance. Of the, of the cell cycle. Um, so that's a trisomy. A monosomy is when an individual has only one representative to only one representative of a chromosome in a cell. Um, in the event that this occurs with a autosome or a chromosome that does not code for sex, um, this is not likely to, this is not going to be a viable situation. Non-disjunction can occur with sex chromosomes X and Y, and this is going to lead to a vastly different outcome. Non-disjunction of sex chromosomes during sperm formation will result in a sperm that will carry both X and Y or no sex chromosome at all. Non-disjunction of a sex chromosome during egg formation will result in an egg having two X chromosomes or none at all. And some examples of these would be Turner syndrome. Turner syndrome is, is um, caused by a monosomy of the X chromosome. There is only one X chromosome present, and so we denote this as X naught. Um, Kleinfelter syndrome, on the other hand, is a um, is a, uh, a situation where in which we have two X chromosomes and a Y chromosome. Um, so what we're going to tend to see is um, a in Kleinfelter syndrome, we do have a uh, male presenting with an extra X chromosome, but what we're going to tend to see is reduced muscle mass, decreased facial hair, um, tall stature, and large breast tissue, delayed puberty, weak bones, testosterone replacement, and fertility treatments can be used to kind of help combat some of these um, symptoms. But I will let you spend a little bit more time looking at um, trisomies and monosomies on your own. So here we have an example of what that might look like if we have a uh, non-disjunction of the egg cell. We're going to end up with, if we end up with two X chromosomes in one cell and none in the other, we're going to end up with an X not female or a, a Y not male. And this one would be inviolable, so it would not survive the zygote stage. Um, in the case of uh, having two X's, we would either have a male with Kleinfelter syndrome or a female with tip, triple X syndrome. In the case, oops, that we have monosomies and trisomies um, or non-disjunction in the in the in the sperm cells, we're going to end up with either an X not female or a um, XXY male again, Kleinfelter syndrome. So, spend a little bit of time looking at these. Um, but that's it for this chapter. You should be able to compare the role of meiosis and mitosis in the cell cycle, differentiate between chromosomes um, and genes, autosomes and sex chromosomes, diploid and haploid cells. You should be able to draw the cell cycle, label each phase of mitosis and interface, and describe the events and significance of each phase. Finally, you should be able to list the events of interface, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase as completed in mitosis, but you should also be able to do that in meiosis. You should be able to define cytokinesis and explain its its role in cellular division. Um, we did not cover karyotypes, so you do, need not, do not need to worry about that bullet point. You should be able, though, to diagram and describe how haploid cells result from meiosis and highlight opportunities for crossing over an independent assortment of chromosomes, meaning that you should know when does that occur. When do crossing over events occur? When do independent assortment, chromo uh, independent assortment um, occur? And then you should also be able to know what those are and explain how those introduce genetic variability. Finally, you should be able to describe how non-disjunction results in an abnormal number of chromosomes in the daughter cells, resulting in either um, Down, Turner, or Kleinfelter syndromes. And that's it for this chapter. Please let me know if you have any comments or questions.